Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. Twitter and tear gas. Indeed, social media and new technology have transformed society and unloaded ammunition of chaos. That compelling image is the title of my guest's new book by Yale University Press, Twitter and Tear Gas, The Power and Fragility of Network Protests. A penetrating analyst of the interaction between technology and society, Zeneb Tufice, of the University of North Carolina School of Information is a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. A native of Istanbul, Turkey turned American scholar, Tufece argues the Internet's grassroots capacity is easy to mobilize but hard to win. Having witnessed firsthand a cycle of digitally catalyzed political protest, resistance, even rebellion, she'll assess with us today their effectiveness and viability in the future. And I urge you to read her Twitter and tear gas, as well as New York Times columns this year. Mark Zuckerberg is in denial. The world is getting hacked. What do we do to stop it? WikiLeaks isn't whistleblowing. The election won't be rigged, but it could be hacked. All essential reading. And I want to congratulate you on this book, Zainab. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. For our viewers who are not as familiar with the digital age, what is network protest? So uh, in the past, if you wanted to get the word out about a protest, you'd usually have to either uh, organize person by person, you know, f using leaflets or phones. And very often, you needed to try to find a way to get on mass media, you know, get on television. Whereas right now, you can use these digital technologies. You can use Facebook groups. You can use Twitter hashtags to get the word out. You can use Google Spreadsheets to organize all the logistics that you're doing. You can use uh, your phone to live stream from a protest. I mean, even if no TV cameras are there, you can have viewership that rivals CNN just from your phone in your pocket. You can communicate in real time. So it's really changed how social movements operate by giving them a whole host of new capabilities that used to be either very expensive or very difficult or just didn't exist. We have, you know, connected supercomputers in our pocket. It's a different world. One example that you've talked about since the book was published of organic protest mm -hmm. that yielded a political outcome was the protest of President Trump's executive orders yes. and the formation of that contingent at airports across the country. You've mentioned that there is great promise in networks, but without a, an organizational structure. Infrastructure, yeah. So how, how, does that, how did that model manifest itself, and, and how is that the outlier from what your book says in taking it to the next step? So let me put it this way. My book's title is The Strength and Fragility for a Reason. The power and fragility of these network protests come at the same time. So there's, for example, let's like look at the airport protest, uh, or let's look at the Women's March. I think that's one that people have seen a lot. It went from Facebook posts to, you know, a million people in the streets in maybe D.C. and also millions of people around the country in just three months, right? It went from idea to execution very quickly. And social media was part of how it could scale up so, so fast. Now compare that to, say, a protest in 1963, a similar march on Washington that, uh, that people know about because Dr. King's famous speech, I Have a Dream. That protest took maybe 10 years 
The movement took 10 years just to get to the place where they could hold the protest with all the logistics it required. I mean, back then it wasn't really easy to get hundreds of thousands of people to DC. And they had to get them out the same day because back then you couldn't really guarantee the safety of people marching against racism um, in DC and stay overnight. So they had to get them in, get them out, do all those things. So a um, protest like that in the past was an expression of years and years of capacity building and infrastructure building. You couldn't even think about doing it before having done that. Whereas something like Women's March, it's more like a question mark because you didn't, you no longer have to spend 10 years just to get to the point. You can have three months and boom, you can scale up very fast. So on the one hand, scaling up that fast really empowers movements because before you couldn't do it. On the other hand, it's a little bit like a car that's going from zero to 100 miles in just 10 minutes and you're building the car along the way and all of a sudden uh, you're 100 miles speeding and you haven't built your steering wheel, right? When you scale up that fast without infrastructure, how do you build, say, collective decision-making capacity? How do you decide what's next? How does the movement weather? You don't have that deep experience that allows movements to take step three, step four, step five. So it's, that's why it's power and fragility in the title. Uh, you have something that really helps step one and step two. You've got springs in your feet, you're jumping really high. But you're not, you're underprepared for step two and step three. You're kind of in the limelight a little before you would have been ready in the past. So while movements look the same like the past, they don't really express the same power with their uh, repertoire of action. To stick with your analogy mm -hmm. of, of a driverless autonomous vehicle that might not know where it's going. In the case of the ACLU suit, there was a political goal. I think you point out quite importantly that in the Women's March and other instances there is not that political infrastructure with directions and an exit in mind. Well, it's both strength and weakness at the same time. Today's movements tend to be more leaderless. Uh, they tend to be very participatory, especially the ones on the left, liberal side of the political spectrum. And on the one hand, I mean, people join movements because they want to have a voice, right? They don't want to be cogs in the machine. So that participatory character they have that allows so many people to find a place in them empowers them. On the other hand, once again, what we see is because you scaled up so fast using digital technology, you don't have a way to decide what's the next tactical turn. And very often these protests are holding, you know, a lot of their discussions say on Facebook. And let me put it this way, Facebook's business model is to keep you on the site as long as possible. Now when you're in a meeting, like what is the first thing you think in a meeting? You want the meeting to end, right? <laughs> you want it to be over, you want it to conclude. But movements today are often holding their meetings in a platform that's designed to make sure nothing concludes because they want to keep <laughs> you there. So you've got this situation where there's no way to decide what's next. So I, I, I saw this in a lot of other countries I studied. So the book came out before, um, I mean, the book came out before the Women's Rights. What you saw is that the movements, because they scale up so fast without decision-making capacity and infrastructure for it, they tend to try to repeat the very last thing they did. It's kind of this tactical freeze. Instead of saying, all right, what's next? And what's the correct way to pressure? Uh, and what's the next steps? There's a lot of this inability to make a decision collectively because you're not ready for it and you, don't, you haven't built the infrastructure means that they keep repeating themselves. They hold another march and another march and another march. That's because they're frozen tactically. Whereas if you look at successful movements in the past, like the civil rights movement, it went through tactic after tactic. You know, you did sit-ins and, you know, first bus boycotts and you have sit-ins and you have lunch counters. You have the march on Washington. You have all these things and each one of them is designed to put pressure on whatever you're trying to pressure. Now, I don't want to sort of sound like I think the civil rights movement was this very neat, unmessy thing. It was very complex. It was very messy. The thing is they had years and years and years of dealing with that tension and mess and the complexity that all movements encompass. Whereas right now, because you got these springs in your feet, you can just jump up so high 
and all of a sudden you're like, okay, what's next? And there is no mechanism to get you to that next point. And I see this in today in the so-called, you know, resistance as they often call themselves. There's a lot of energy. There's an enormous amount of grassroots energy and there's a lot of people doing stuff, but it's not always clear what's the coherent next, next tactical best move that could bring together all this energy and most productively direct it. Amen. I, I have to say that one of the reasons I love your New York Times column is because you identify, I think, realities of the technological space from that sociological perspective that the folks who are stakeholders are unwilling to recognize. For instance, Google and Facebook invite their shareholders to determine if they should take a strong position on fake news. This was just mm -hmm. in the news. Right. And the answer was no. Right. There was no acknowledgement from the corporate hierarchy or their stakeholders that this is something they ought to invest time and energy in thinking about. And so you're an expert at once on the new technology and authoritarianism. So I, I was hoping that you could reflect on um, the, the American veering towards a despotic state and reflect on how, how, you, how the Turkish experience informs what you see in the U.S. Well, now. I would say that my uh, experience of studying this isn't just you know, my home country, Turkey, because I also studied the Middle East and Europe, and I think there's a global wave towards uh, you know sort of states where there's a strong man it's almost always a man but in France we saw it could be a strong woman too um, that um, promises sort of safety among global turmoil and that seems to be attractive so what's going on part of what's going on here you know let's talk about the US experience because that's I think uh, more uh, let's talk about the US experience because that's easier to understand one of the things that a social movement for positive change has to do is convince people to do something, right? You're trying to affirmatively convince people. Whereas an authoritarian government or an authoritarian movement only has to paralyze people and confuse people to stop them from acting. So this is where fake news and misinformation online uh, comes into play. Uh, currently, the business model of Facebook is to keep you there as long as possible. You know, Google, keep you there as long as possible because they're ad-driven. They're just they're selling your eyeballs to advertisers. So that means that they only want to engage you. They put some controls finally after all the brouhaha, but this has been going on for years and they had been warned about this for years. Um, when you, you have this kind of misinformation that can just go viral online because the country's already polarized as it is in the United States. What it created, a thing, it's not just the fake news, it's also the misinformation, it's also the echo chambers. What it created is a situation where a lot of people got so many conflicting pieces of information and so many claims and so many things that people feel disempowered and they disengage from politics. And the more people disengage from politics and the more they're just sort of like, I can't make heads or tails out of this because there's so many competing claims and you have weakening journalism because all the ad money is going to Facebook and Google, so you have local news that's decimated. It's harder for people to have credible sources to figure out what's exactly going on. And when people politically disengage, that's easier for authoritarianism and authoritarians to come into that space with misinformation, with scapegoating, with you know, claims that don't actually hold water if you had uh, in-depth examination of them, but are just proliferating. So when I grew up in Turkey, I grew up under censorship because it was the post-1980 military coup. I was a child and there was heavy censorship. And when the internet first came, I thought, you know what, censorship's not gonna work. We'll always be able to somehow route around it and connect to it, and I was hopeful about that. What I hadn't anticipated is that information glut and misinformation works as a form of censorship. If you can't block people from accessing the information, you can flood them with so much misinformation that they can't make sense of the information. You can paralyze people from political action by confusing them, by distorting the sort of the re reality and creating all this fake news and misinformation. It's almost better than censorship by blocking information because the information is actually there, but can you find it? 
in this clot, you can't find it. So that, I think, and that's sort of the last, uh, it's the penultimate chapter in my book, is that authoritarians and governments have figured out how to use misinformation and fake news and all the other things that we've seen in the U.S. too, but we see it at a lot of places around the world, to create a public sphere that's not healthy and that is not really very compatible with a healthy liberal democracy. There is that symbiotic, if not parasitic, relationship because there is an authoritarian orientation mm -hmm that we don't recognize when we're participating in digital media, social media. I like to say it's kind of a faux libertarianism in the sense that what you're being fed is not your choice. Um, it comes down to fundamentally media literacy, does it not, and a decision that a citizen is going to make that they're not going to get their news from just an ad hoc sampling of what their friends may post on Facebook and or Twitter. And it's not even an ad hoc sampling. What a lot of people don't realize is that, for example, Facebook organizes your social media feed and it chooses what to show you and what to hide. It ranks it and it's got algorithms that are predicting what will make you stay on the site. That's all they care about. And right? that's why it's really not libertarian. It's no, not it's free not. thought. It's not. It's, it's a it's, corporate authoritarianism. It's a corporate form of trying to keep you there. And they don't even tell you that, look, we're not showing you everything. We're just ranking you. Now, obviously, they can't show you everything. There has to be a way to pick because there's too much. But they make the process of how they pick. They hide it. They don't tell you. They don't give you control over it. They're like, here you go. And most people don't even know that they're picking. So if you want to keep people on the site, uh, from my observations over the years, I think it promotes two kinds of dates, news. One of them is the cute, cuddly stuff, the things that make us feel good. So that's why your Facebook is full of baby pictures, engagement news, all those things that sort of make us feel good and we click on like, you get more of it. The other thing that I see online a lot is that if there's a quarrel, an argument, a dispute, it grabs our attention. I mean, it's like rubbernecking a car wreck, right? You kind of are like, oh, what's going on there? So it also promotes that. So it also promotes um, echo chambers because we feel more comfortable. But it also promotes things that push you a little to the edge of wherever you are because that can also be engaging. So none of these, I mean, everything that they do is optimized towards keeping you on the site. And I liken this to say, I mean, obviously people have an appetite for this stuff. Uh, I liken this to the way we have a sweet tooth, like humans crave sugar and salt. And that's a perfectly reasonable thing because we evolved under scarcity of sugar and salt. So if your ancestors didn't like sugar and salt, they weren't doing very well. It's good that whenever they could rarely find it, they ate it up. But now you're in a sugar and salt overload. And you've got a company like Facebook whose business model is people have a weakness for sugar and they have a weakness for salt. So let's serve them sugar, salt for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And when people do eat it because there is already demand for it, you just throw up your hands and say, oh, you know what? That's what people want. Well, you're, you're designing their choice architecture to their most vulnerable thing that is a very instant thing. You're just sort of like what people want right at that moment to click. And the real consideration is, well, maybe ask me what I want, right? What I want when I wake up in the morning, when I wake up, when I, when I have time to reflect, and when I say, I don't want just sugar and salt for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Here are the choices I would like to make. Do not just constantly tempt me with things that aren't necessarily good for me. And the same thing with news and the same thing with public sphere. If it were healthier, there'd be a way of, instead of just trying to tempt people instantaneously to click, 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 and to stay on site, stay on site, we would ask people, what do you think is a healthy diet for you? What do you think is a healthy information diet for you? And I would say, personally, I would say, show me some views I disagree with. Show me credible news. Uh, show me updates from friends that may or may not be in my same political view. Uh, I mean, and this goes across the political spectrum. For example, before the election, I did not see a single status update, as far as I could tell, from any of my Facebook friends that were sympathetic or supporting of Trump. I had some. I mean, obviously, I'm a college professor in a liberal town, so more of my friends are in the Democratic Party side of the aisle. But I had friends over the years, some from high school, middle school, some from elsewhere, 
And I actually would have liked to have seen some of what they were saying. I would have liked to have seen more of, say, credible news. I would like to have seen more of different points of view. I don't mean just show me everything, but I have no choice. When I go online, Facebook's like, I think this is what's going to keep you on the site. Let me give you more of what I think will engage you. And I don't think that's very healthy for our public sphere. I can hear our, our mutual friend, Astra Taylor, who yeah. talks about the spinach of our cultural diet. Yeah. But fundamentally, I wanted to get at this question in the American context now. It is pretty clear that not a sufficient number of Americans are concerned with the theft of information online. Uh, this goes beyond privacy concerns. They're not concerned with what have been digital water gates for the last four years, courtesy of WikiLeaks. So, um, so what I want to say is that, like, whistleblowing is a time-honored tradition. It's an important tradition, and I support it, right? You have a history of whistleblowers. But what we've seen in the past election cycle, I argued, wasn't whistleblowing, because what you saw was the Democratic Party infrastructure up and down the ballot. It wasn't just the DNC. It wasn't just Hillary Clinton's campaign manager. Even local races, the Democratic candidates were hacked, their information stolen. And for example, if they spent a lot of money conducting polls and sort of doing strategy, the information was handed over to their opponents. This is political sabotage. I mean, it's not whistleblowing to steal people's internal polls that they paid a lot of money to and to steal their strategy documents and you unilaterally give it to the other political side in the hopes of sabotaging them. So, uh, But I'm saying that yeah. there's a, a difference in mindset. You go back and watch all the president's men or read mm -hmm. the transcripts of Republican press conferences and the RNC's initial reaction to what they called a disgraceful or despicable act and yet in this country we had a president who said Russia find those 30,000 emails so it's it is part what you're describing the popular culture has hijacked this and hopefully we can rescue back certain democratic norms that are not guaranteed anymore in this country but it's also the reality these are digital water gates right so the thing is I think uh, stealing information and just sort of dumping it all online like that uh, is not, I, as I said, I don't think it's whistleblowing and I don't think it's healthy. What, and, what are some corrective measures? If and any I now? think, I have to say, you know, the social media side was very important because there was a lot of things that went viral that was misinformation based on WikiLeaks hacks. But our mass media too, I think failed, absolutely failed because they, they took the stuff and they just couldn't keep their eyes off it. There's a lot of, I mean, if there's a public interest news story in it, I don't mind the public interest news story. If there's some wrongdoing, criminal acts, corruption, by all means. But they got obsessed with the gossip side that was exposed, right? Because when, whenever you have a campaign's email, they're going to be talking about reporters. And I watch as reporters were constantly Googling themselves on the site and seeing, did they mention me? And they were talking about it. And I saw, for example, Washington Post front page had a story in October of 2016, we're talking like a month before a crucial election, and their front page was about a year and a half ago, according to WikiLeaks stolen emails, some Huffington Post blogger had emailed John Podesta something something about Bernie Sanders. I mean, there was literally no news value to it. It wasn't relevant to the thing. It wasn't even something the Clinton campaign did. Somebody had emailed it to them. But because it was gossipy and it fed the Sanders-Clinton thing that got clicks, they were discussing that a month before the election. And I don't mean to say, why didn't they go light on Hillary Clinton? They should have been tough on her, but in ways that were credible and fair. And they should have been tough on... Uh, candidate Trump, so instead of covering gossip from stolen documents, they should have covered, say, the conflict of interest, according to the, you know, the business versus the presidency. In fact, I did a, a cursory search of all uh, media uh, before the election for, say, New York Times, Washington Post, and Politico, and they had enormous coverage on emails and WikiLeaks, and they compared to, say, conflict of interest, if, you know, candidate Trump becomes a president, it was maybe 20% of that. So they were 
drowning in the sort of stolen stuff that was just dropped in front of them like candy week by week, instead of doing their job, which was to ask tough questions and do tough investigations on both candidates so that we could have a more informed choice. So it's not just social media that's kind of failing us. It's also the digital media, the news media is chasing clicks, part of the story. And also 90% uh, of ad money goes now to Facebook and Google, which means that local news is decimated. So you have a lot of local corruption that's no longer being covered. So we're kind of drowning in information. If you have all the time in the world to seek it out, it's kind of there. But we're really missing credible gatekeepers that can help us make sense of it. We're missing local newspapers that can you know, chase it. And meanwhile, we've, I, I think there's a lot of things to be worried about. In the minute we have remaining, where is there hope? Where is there hope here? Where is there hope in more? Oh, there's a lot of hope. Despotic regimes where there is real censorship. It's, you know, it's not misinformation oh, guided censorship. It's there's no Wikipedia, there's no encyclopedia. Turkey, so, uh, Egypt. What I would say is that there's a lot of hope because the same technologies that bring all these complications also allow us to connect to one another. And I think you know, we don't have to surrender to the few big companies that have these business models. I don't think we've explored all the positive things that can be done with this connectivity. And that's why, again, you know, the power and fragility. That's why my book has Twitter and tear gas, but it has this, both the positive sides. Because I'm not a curmudgeon. I'm for using the technology for the things it's really good for. And I think we should bring real public pressure and political pressure on the big platforms like Facebook and Google, because you're part of the public sphere now. And you know, you're almost half a trillion dollar in market cap. You can do better. We should hold them to higher standards the way we hold media to higher standards. We try at least. We should hold ourselves to higher standards. We should fund and develop new tools to help us make sense of it. We should find new business models to support real journalism. We should engage our institutions. I mean, it's the kind of world now that if you don't engage politically, if you don't engage your news media, if you don't engage the big platform, Silicon Valley, they just run and do what they want. And that's not healthy. I think we need to use these digital technologies to connect to one another, to seek healthier ways of organizing our public sphere, organizing how we get information and how we hold movements and how we go forward. Well, whether it's your New York Times column, Zenep, or Twitter and tear gas, you're importing those values uh, to your Twitter handle and your Facebook presence. Thank That's you. so important. Thank you so much. Thank you for the kind words. Thank you. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash open mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Angelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, with special thanks to the Schumann Media Center for additional support, and to the corporate community Mutual of America.